So, yes, um, you may know this quote from Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's a good observation from a science fiction writer. It's a good observation from a scholar of religion and myth um, and ritual is, is that functionally these two things are no different and throughout the series we've been talking about them in the same vein because I think they are in the same vein. <clears throat> this is from Xenophon, uh, 4th century BCE Athenian historian who tells this story about Socrates and love magic. And Socrates, making light of his own laziness, said, but it is not at all easy, Theodote, for me to get free for much business, both private and public, keeps me busy. And I have also got my girlfriends, who neither day nor night allow me to escape from them, since they are learning both love potions and incantations from me. And Theodotus says, indeed, do you also know how to do these things, Socrates, she said? Why, what is the reason that Master Apollodorus and Antisthenes never leave me, do you suppose? And why do Cebes and Simeus come to me from Thebes? I assure you, these things don't happen without the help of the many potions and spells and magic wheels that I use. Socrates. Socrates was the first and maybe the best ironist also, so we should not take that too seriously, but I thought it was an interesting passage. Tonight's uh, <clears throat> title is Eros Ex Machina. It's, uh, I was a little worried that it was too much of a play on uh, Deus Ex Machina and that it's too much of a literary professor inside joke. So if you know, or if you don't, Deus Ex Machina means from the God, uh, a machine from the God, right? And it was used in, um, in ancient theater, ancient drama, to lower the gods onto the stage. And not only that, it, was, it had a kind of literal mechanistic interpretation, but it, it had come to be, has come to be, a solution to a problem <clears throat> that kind of solves everything. And in literature, it's seen as a bit of a cheat. Um, so you build up this plot and these characters in this conflict and suddenly, you know, God or some other plot device comes in like, oh, it was all a dream. And uh, it's, that's why it's seen as a bit of a cheat. But tonight we're using it in terms of Eros, the great god of love, Eros. And how Eros, love and sex, relate to technology or the machine. So remember our old friend Hephaestus, the god of technology, um, a cripple as they call him in the text. He was, uh, he had a bad leg and um, he gets around. He was married to Aphrodite, that's right, Aphrodite, this ugly man, again, according to the text, a man who is disabled, but he knows how to do things. He knows how to create things. He's a techne. He's a creator of technology, and he uses this all the time. Uh, so this is his story of Aphrodite. Um, he was married to Aphrodite, but of course Aphrodite has an affair with Ares, or Mars, you may know him. And he fixes up a snare for them. So, god of technology, right? So he creates this trap for them. And the text reads, when Ares came to the rendezvous with Aphrodite, he together with her fell into the snare so that he could not extricate himself. And from their embrace, Harmonia was born. And to her, Athena and Hephaestus gave a robe dipped in crimes. Uh, so Harmonia has to wear this robe dipped in the crimes of her parents. Uh, and because of this, the text reads, their descendants are clearly marked as ill-fated, marked by a technological trap. He also uh, tries to get with Athena, and that does not go so well. 
uh, the goddess of wisdom, who's a virgin goddess. Um, and, the, and the text reads this. Athena went to Hephaestus because she wanted to make some weapons. She went to the god of technology for weapons, but he, now deserted by Aphrodite, let himself become aroused by Athena and started chasing her as she ran from him. When he caught up with her with much effort, for he was lame, the text says, he tried to enter her. But she, being the model of virginal self-control, would not let him. So as he ejaculated, his semen fell on her leg. In revulsion, Athena wiped it off with some wool, which she threw on the ground. And as she was fleeing and the semen fell to the earth, Erichthonius came into being. I know, right? How'd your parents meet? Well, <laughs> you see. Um, Aglaia and Hephaestus, the famous lame one, capitalized, made Aglaia, the youngest of Carites, his buxom wife. So I'm not reading you this because it's kind of fun, but it is fun. Uh, but, but you see early on in our Greek mythology, at least, this connection between the god of technology and love. Uh, he even tries to court Persephone, but that is not going to happen, right? Because um, uh, the Lord of Hades is not going to let that happen, but he tries. So it's interesting that this god, who is described in almost every instance as crippled or lame or disabled, does not feel disabled because he is the god of technology. There is, of course, the wonderful, wonderful story of Pygmalion in Galatea. And we get this from Ovid in his Metamorphoses. Uh, so Pygmalion, an artist, a sculptor, a creator, a techne, uh, saw these, women's, the, these women, the propatides, uh, prostitutes in the Agora. And he saw them waste their lives in wretched shame and critical of faults which nature had so deeply planted through their female hearts. He lived in preference for many years unmarried. But when he was single and with consummate skill, these are Ovid's words, he carved a statue out of snow white ivory and gave, it, gave to it exquisite beauty, which no woman of the world has ever equaled. She was so beautiful that he fell in love with his creation. Technology and love. Uh, and she's wonderful, uh, and he's very happy with her. It's the first sex doll. Um, and so he goes to, to worship Aphrodite. He goes to her temple, and he, and he gives her an offering, and the flame shoots up three times, and he knows that he's been blessed by the goddess of love. And so he comes back, and he begins to speak to Galatea, his magnificent sculpture. And there's a lot of language here about, very sensual language about how he touches the sculpture, this creation of his. Um, and, he, and the text says, the softest tones are used each time he speaks to her, this thing, this object. He brings to her such presents as are surely prized by sweet girls such as smooth round pebbles, shells, and birds. You want birds? All right, the prize by sweet girls. Birds, fl fragrant flowers of a thousand tints, lilies, painted balls, okay, and amber tears, uh, which just still from fall off, far off trees. He drapes her in rich clothing and in gems, he puts rings on her fingers and a rich necklace around her neck. And Ovid goes on and on because he loves these descriptions. And then what happens is he falls in love and she, he comes back from, the, um, from worshiping Aphrodite and Ovid says this, it's an early Turing test. She acts like a human being. 
Now, real, true to life, the maiden felt the kisses given to her and blushing, lifted up her timid eyes so that she saw the light and sky above as well as her rapt lover while he leaned gazing beside her and all this at once, the goddess graced the marriage she had willed. And when nine times the crescent moon had changed, increasing to the full, the statue bride, statue bride, gave birth to her dear daughter, Pathos, from which famed event, the island, takes its name. All right, Pygmalion and Galatea. Um, so, what are we talking about? We're talking about love and sex and magic and technology. And so there's actually a great book called uh, Ancient Greek Love Magic by uh, Christopher Ferrone. And he catalogs these spells from ancient Greece. It's really interesting. I want you to hear, especially given our discussion last week about technology and power. Okay, listen to this. These are ancient Greek they're not really love spells, as you'll hear. They're sex spells. Bring to perfection this binding love spell in order that Theodotus, the daughter of Euus, may never have the experience of another man alone. Ammonian, she being enslaved, driven mad, flying through the air in search of me. Ammonian, son of Hermeteris, so that she may bring her thigh to my thigh and her nature to my nature for intercourse always for the entire time of her life. No power at all there. Here's another one. Drag Heronus by her hair and by her guts to me. Poseidonius, every hour of time by night and day until Heronius comes to me. Now, now, quickly, quickly. Burn, torch the soul of Alus, torch the soul, her female body, her limbs, until she leaves the household of Apollonius. Lay Alus low, lay her low, with fever, unceasing sickness, incomprehensible sickness. Take away, here's another one, take away the sleep of that woman until she comes to me and pleases my soul. Loving, burning on account of her love and desire for me. Force her to have sex with me. Force her to come to me, loving, burning with love and desire, etc., from her parents, from her bedroom, and force her to love me and give me what I want. There is, of course, Kirke, or Circe, uh, on her island, who was the goddess of sorcery, or pharmacaea, pharmacy. It's where we get the word pharmacy, uh, who is skilled in the magic of transmutation, illusion, necromancy. She lived on an island with her nymph companions, and you may remember that Odysseus comes to her island and she transforms his men into swine. But with the help of the god Hermes, Odysseus overcomes her and forced her to end the spell the technology, the magic of her spell. Um, this is interesting that I didn't know before. Kirke's name is derived from a Greek word, kirku, meaning to secure with rings or to hoop around, referencing her binding power of magic. And then our old friend Aphrodite, and the goddess Aphrodite, this is from Pindar, the goddess Aphrodite made plain to Ison's son Jason the lore of her prayers and the spells of magic incantation that he might rob Medea's heart, driving her with persuasion's lash. And that worked out really well, Jason and Medea. I'm kidding, of course. And then there's our old friend Socrates that we saw from Xenophon. Well, we have a history of magic, we have a history of technology, and it would be odd if we didn't apply that to the thing that we say is the most important thing in, in the world, and that is love uh, and sex, and you know, how to tell those two apart 
is difficult sometimes. We also have a history of sex as technology. Okay, and that's really interesting too, and it makes a certain amount of sense uh, if you think about it. I used to teach courses on religion and sexuality, and I'm like, this has got to be the most obvious thing in the world, right? You must connect religion to sexuality, and the ancient world did, without hesitation, um, connect those two things. Because if you live in a world where you perceive duality, there's no better metaphor no metaphor that feels as good as sex. And this is an old, old story with us that, of course, we forgot and got lost. And we can blame the Puritans if we want, but, but we still do it in other ways. There is, of course, Tantra. Uh, it's, it's a movement that transcends religion, so you'll find it in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, of all things. Uh, and it's one of those really interesting things that cuts across. Fundamentalism, for example, cuts across religions. Um, you find it in every religion. Tantra, you, you find it in, in many Eastern religions. The word means loom, warp, uh, and so metaphorically it means groundwork system or doctrine from the word tan to stretch or to extend. And so you know, probably, that um, Tantra is, those who practice Tantra, whether they were Hindu, Buddhist, or Jain, or uh, Californians, um, do so with an eye, more than an eye, <laughs> with their bodies directed toward the sacred. And again, this makes perfect sense if to see this as a religious thing. Um, and in that regard, uh, we have another tradition, similar, called the uh, Coetus Reservatus, very similar. So, so the idea with Tantra is to use sex as a technology, as a kind of magical ritual in which to achieve transcendence. And we have this too in uh, other areas of the world. So for example, by the way, I don't know if you know Aeon Magazine, but that's the best magazine out there. I, I just never fail to find something interesting. And of course, this month they have an article on Tantra and sexuality. So this is from that. Semen has often been considered a sacred fluid. Um, interesting that menstrual blood has been seen as an unclean fluid. Semen as um, a sacred fluid. Aristotle thought semen was made of brain tissue. Just sit with that for a second. No extra charge for that. Um, in China, for example, the tenets of sexual ritual, this is uh, David Gray in Aeon Magazine. Um, he quotes Sunu, a goddess courtesan, which was often the case in the ancient world, goddess courtesan, sometimes called temple prostitutes. Um, she, uh, this is a text called the classic of Sunu. She instructs the yellow emperor on the best ways to enjoy life and sex. She says this, one should calm the mind, harmonize the emotions and con concentrate the spirit, very Chinese values, before intercourse. Before intercourse, <laughs> not after, right? Having settled the body and composed one's thoughts, she writes that the male should penetrate deeply and move slowly. But hold on, guys. The male should avoid climax to stave off, I love this, to stave off the inevitable bout of postcoital depression. However, the text reads, when Qing semen is emitted, the whole body feels weary. One suffers buzzing in the ears, <laughs> drowsiness in the eyes, the throat is parched and the joints are heavy. And there's, sure, there's brief pleasure, and in the end there is discomfort. By withholding his semen, the text reads, the emperor would not only stay healthy, 
but extend his life indefinitely, which was a major goal of Chinese thought. She, the text reads this, nine acts without emission, and one will enjoy unlimited longevity. 10 acts without emission, and one attains the realm of the immortals. Further, she says, the emperor should have intercourse frequently with as many partners as possible, <laughs> while, while, while focusing on the pleasure of the female. No whoops, okay. <laughs> In the end, the yellow emperor seems to have learned his lessons well, it is said he kept a harem of 1,200 women entertained by not climaxing, remember, and he achieved his immortality. Do you know about the Oneida community in upstate New York? Fascinating, right? Um, silverware. Yeah, silverware. Silverware? They, oh, did they make silverware? Yeah, there, yeah, a lot of people are the, um, That's the name. They, they did silverware in addition to. Into, in addition to, okay. Thank you for that. Um, so this was, as some of you know, a utopian community in upstate New York. Uh, and the minister there is John Humphrey Noyes, who is a cousin of President Rutherford B. Hayes. And he practiced this coitus reservatus, this sex magic, as a crude but workable form of birth control. Young men were trained in the art of not having an orgasm by older women who stood little chance of getting pregnant should something happen. Male continence, he calls it, the, the reverend does, since it placed male gratification on the back burner, so to speak, and it liberated the female orgas orgasm from the long Victorian winter <laughs> it had been experiencing. It allowed members of the group to practice free love. In fact, monogamy was forbidden, forbidden, and created an equality between men and women, both inside and outside the bedroom. That was almost unheard of in that era. Uh, let's see, Noyes said, um, through coitus reservatus, the humdrum act of intercourse turned into a spiritual even an artistic endeavor. It will rank, he said, above music, painting, sculpture, and all the other arts, for it combines the charms and benefits of them all. Not having an orgasm, gentlemen. There is Carissa, which kind of comes out of that, um, introduced by Margaret Sanger and Ida Craddock to push for a coitus reservatus in the early 20th century. This is the Latin word for, uh, sorry, Latin, the Italian word for caress. Uh, by the Chicago-based gynecologist and public school teacher, <laughs> Alice Bunker Stockham. Her chief interest was the plight of the, quote, orgasm-starved working woman. And she addressed this to all husbands and wrote in 1896, men who are borne down with sorrow because your wives are nervous, feeble, and irritable have it in their own power through Coriza to restore the radiant hue of health to the faces of loved ones, strength and elasticity to their steps in a harmonious action of every part of the body. Uh, we talked about Huxley a few months ago, and we didn't mention this long enough, but he, his last work was called Island, and in it he has, it's a kind of utopia. It, it's not the Huxley usual dystopia. Uh, it's a kind of utopia where coitus reservata is practice, and then there's Alan Watts, former Anglican priest and Zen Buddhist who spoke here uh, many years ago, uh, who called regular orgasm for men nothing more than a sneeze in the loins. <laughs> he called for contemplative love, uh, only quite secondarily, 
a matter of technique. Technique? He wrote in 1958. Quote, for it has no specific aim. There is nothing particular that has to be made to happen. It is simply that a man and a woman are together exploring their spontaneous feeling without any preconceived idea of what that ought to be. Since the sphere of contemplation is not what should be, but what is. All right. Of course, no discussion of sex magic would be complete without Aleister Crowley. But before Crowley, there was Pascal Beverly Randolph. There is dates. And of course, again, if you see sex as energy, and as, that is a energy to be harnessed, then you want to pay attention to it if, if you want to transcend. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a new kind of spiritualism that gave birth to the term soulmates, by the way. Um, Randolph was an interesting guy, an eclectic physician who specialized in marital problems uh, and developed a, an, a, te a teaching of occult sexuality that understood sex as a transfer of energy between couples during intercourse. And so he, he laid the foundation for sex magic with a K as it was embodied in uh, the OTO, which was a German magic order. He was also known as the Rosicrucian, and um, central figure in the, the how shall we say, the uh, transfer of Rosicrucianism to the United States. Uh, so there is the Ordo Templi Orientis. Ceremonial magic is focused on energy for accomplishment of mundane goals and the great work of union with the ultimate, again, an ancient and noble idea and practice. Uh, so they use chanting to mind-altering drugs um, and, uh, and sex as ritual. And then, of course, there is Aleister Crowley, who comes along independently of the OTO and a uh, former member of the Her Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He formed his own group. He eventually became part of the OTO. You, you may know this story better than I do. Uh, but he was interested in resurrecting the magic of, of John Dee and Edward Kelly, et cetera, and put that considered sex as the highest form of ritual. Now, let's talk about some technological developments in love. The first one, I mean, you could, we've been going back, right? But more recently, newspapers in 1870, the technology of love. The first known personal ads, I love this, appear in a, in a British agricultural journal, okay? Um, the publisher says, tis probable that such advertisements may prove very useful. 1870, uh, a first newspaper for singles, the Matrimonial News, begins publication in the post-gold rush era of San Francisco. Men pay 25 cents to place an ad. Women post free. Ladies' night at the club, right? <laughs> by 1900, there were no, by 1900, there were at least 20 such publications. 1910s, lonely soldiers of World War I, and women connect over personal ads. And I love this because, again, last week we talked about power and technology. Power is always there. In fact, as uh, Langdon Winter said, power is in the objects and the practices themselves. So we have the lonely soldiers of World War I connecting with women through personal ads. The authorities suspect there are coded messages there. And I'm sure they were right, but not the kind of coded messages they were looking for. A trial finds the publisher of this, uh, these ads guilty of gross indecency, and the paper shuts down in 1921. What do you think the gross indecency was? Gay men were using it. 2000. San Francisco's Craigslist begins offering free personal ads. Not that you would know. 
Um, in 2010, the site closes an erotic services section after accusations that it facilitates prostitution and sex trafficking. Data and dating. 1940s, a New York-based company uses data as the foundation of a matchmaking service for, quote, social equivalents. Contact information for a match costs 25 cents. 1959, a student project becomes the first known computer dating service when an IBM 650 computer determines similarities between 98 subjects based on a 30 question profile. 1965, a Harvard student, why is it always a Harvard student? Uh, Jeff Tarr co-founds Operation Match. It was used by more than a million daters in the 1960s. We're not trying to take the love out of love, Jeff Tarr wrote. We're just trying to make it more efficient. Ah, there's a dangerous word, isn't it? Efficient. That's in 1966 he said that. Uh, I didn't know this. 1965, uh, this data service uh, improves, as technology always does. Um, 100 questions now on an IBM 1400 computer. New York City's first dating service called TACT, T-A-C-T, if only. Despite thousands of new customers, the co-founder, this is 1965, the co-founder believes computer dating is a fad and he sells his stock in the company. <laughs> I know, right? 1982, the music you heard coming in, Kraftwerk's single, Computer Love, reaches number one on the UK singles chart. <clears throat> um, and more and more. Um, Oh, right, I've got to tell you some of this stuff. It's so funny. 2004, uh, 40 years after Operation Match, OkCupid okay, is founded, uh, et cetera. They, f they connect it to tweeting, and they find that frequent tweeters have shorter relationships than non-tweeters. And that the, I love this, the best predictor of whether a date will involve sex on the first date is whether he, and sh he or she enjoys the taste of beer. <laughs> we didn't know that already, right? All right, lots more, but I, I don't want to get too bogged down here. Video dating, 2005. Um, I didn't know this. Three PayPal employees dream up a video dating site called TuneIn Hookup. Uh, with user uploaded video. They scrap the idea and create instead, does anybody know? YouTube. Very good, YouTube. They created YouTube. It began as a dating site. Uh, they mentioned chat roulette here. Does anybody remember chat roulette? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you have fond memories of chat roulette? <laughs> I'm guessing not. Uh, then, of course, there's online dating. <laughs> so now we can start studying this stuff. And so the average length of courtship before marriage for couples who met online, 18 and a half months. For people who do not meet online, that is offline, 42 months. Make of that what you will. Uh, there's so much here. Friend finder, one and only, date hookup, plenty of fish. Uh, okay. And then there is, of course, the bane of our existence, social networking. Um, in a recent poll, North American women said they enjoy social networking more than dating. 75%. Uh, enjoy social networking more than dating. Uh, let's see. Doesn't say. Sorry. <laughs> you think it might have changed. 81% um, of online daters lie about their age, height, or weight. But no one here would do that. Uh, and then, of course, mobile apps, uh, etc. So, some of you may know about this, um, 
more than others. Um, I met my wife on Facebook, so I'm guilty. And then I quit Facebook, because that's how you do it. <laughs> you get in and you get out of social media. So love in the time of the internet. So you know about this, right? And you, you know all this is happening. Maybe you're even participating in it. Justin Garcia of the Kinsey Institute. Okay, so this is not just some guy with a blog. This is the Kinsey Institute of Sex, Gender, and Reproduction says that this is the second greatest shift in human sexual habits is social media and mobile apps, etc. The second greatest shift. What's the first one? Marriage. So there's marriage and then there's Tinder. And these are... These are the two significant changes in love and sex. And of course, um, it's hard to tell what's symptom and what's cause, especially when you're right in the middle of a phenomenon. So he says this, based on the research that we've done on sexual hookup cultures and sexual romantic relationships, I tend to think that a lot of the technologies that are used for casual sexual relationships are more a symptom of larger cultural shifts than they are causal, sorry. And of course, there's always the Faustian exchange that we talked about. Uh, this is Jennifer, a 32-year-old professional from an article called Love Me Tender. T-I-N-D. Had to be done, right? Somebody had to write them. She says this, the thing about tech and sex is that it increases ease, accountability, access, and diversity, but what you lose is authenticity and the contact you might otherwise have. Authenticity. Hmm. And then the expert on love that we've referenced in our love series many times is Helen Fisher, who's amassed a, a lot of data and, and, and done deep and broad studies on sex and love, says this, the technology hasn't changed love. Here's what she says. How is technology changing love? I'm going to say almost not at all. I study the brain, she says. I and my colleagues have put over 100 people into a brain scanner. People who had just, doesn't that just sound creepy right there? Okay, people who had just fallen happily in love, people who had just been rejected in love, and people who are in love long term. And it is possible to remain in love long term. And I've long ago maintained that we've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. And she articulates this very well in her work, Anatomy of Love, and, and all her many lectures, and et cetera. It's sex drive. It's feelings of intense romantic love that, is, that goes beyond just sex. And then it's what she calls a deep cosmic attachment to our long-term partner. And she said, these three brain systems orchestrate all the parts of our sexual and romantic lives. And, she's, and the implication there is that technology is not going to affect that. We can discuss that. Uh, she also talks about uh, a phenomenon that we hear in other realms, and that is the uh, paradox of choice. She says this, technology is producing one modern trend that I find particularly important. It's associated with the concept of the paradox of choice. For millions of years, we lived in little hunting and gathering groups. You didn't have the opportunity to choose between 1,000 people on a dating site. In fact, she continues, I've been studying this recently and I actually think there's some sort of sweet spot in the brain. I don't know what it is, but apparently from reading a lot of the da data, we can embrace about five to nine alternatives. And after that, uh, alternatives for dating prospect. And after that, you get into what academics call cognitive overload, and you don't choose any. It's like Netflix. <laughs> um, another uh, a relationship psychologist, Esther Perel, says this. We've created what I call stable ambiguity. Stable ambiguity is when you are too afraid to be alone, but also not really willing to engage in intimacy building. Oh, okay. 
some recognition out there. It's a set of tactics that kind of prolong the uncertainty of a relationship, but also the uncertainty of the breakup. So here on the internet, you have three major, one, three major ones. One is icing and simmering, which are great stalling tactics that offer a kind of holding pattern that emphasize the undefined nature of relationship, but at the same time gives you enough of a comforting consistency and enough freedom of the undefined boundaries. I think we used to call that the friend zone, but now it has a much nicer name, or maybe not. All right, so we talked last time about technology and power, and we've been talking all along about how technology restructures consciousness, from speaking to writing to print to electronic media, especially communications technology, technologies restructure our consciousness. And there is nothing, there's no better example of that than birth control. <laughs> okay. And of course, we mentioned Margaret Sanger already, um, and she is responsible, well, in fact, she's, uh, a book about her says she's the person most responsible for transforming, transforming birth control from a widespread private practice into a political public movement. She was working as a visiting nurse in New York, and she was appalled by what she saw in terms of the health conditions, especially of lower class women who were giving birth to children they couldn't afford to raise or resorting to dangerous back alley abortions. And that galvanized her life's work, in fact. So, she went to Europe in 1915 and learned about diaphragms, and she came back to the United States determined to do something about this and was eventually arrested for um, promoting birth control because technology is never without power associated with it. Uh, so she illegally opened the country's first, first birth control clinic in New York in 1921, and she founded an organization called Planned Parenthood, exactly. So the great technological advances that our species has experienced involve separation of things. Stop and think about it for a minute. So writing, which I would argue is the most profound technology we've ever created, restructuring consciousness like nothing else. Writing is the separation of words from breath. So in oral, oral cultures, words were made of breath because they quite literally are, which means that they're ephemeral. They disappear, right? By the time you hear the first, the last part of this sentence, the first part of the sentence is gone. It's gone, it's nowhere. And so that creates a culture of, around the preciousness of words. And it creates a culture where words are events. And it creates a culture where words create. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, you take that and you separate it now. You separate the word from the breath. And now you have an object. You have a book, and it's outside of you, and I won't go over this again, but there it is. There's, that was my breath that came from near my heart and is very ephemeral, and now it's, it's not so ephemeral. It's, it's a thing, and it's, you know what? It's going to be a thing for a while. Meanwhile, I won't be anymore. So that my words are going to last longer than me. So that separation... Another separation occurred when we took writing and separated it from the page with movable type. Gutenberg, 15th century, China had done it long before, but you separate the word from the page. If you do that, you can do a lot of different things. And what, well, and then current technology separated, separated us even more so that you can have words that aren't an object, they're on a screen, etc. What Margaret Sanger and others did was separate, quite simply, sex from pregnancy. And you think, yeah, duh. But you, I don't think we understand the enormity 
of that technology, of birth control, which has been around for a long time. But what it does to liberate women, uh, and this is not a feminist point, although I'm happy for it to be, it's simply a point, is that if you give women freedom from, be from being forced to have children, they, well, let me just tell you, I have some statistics for you, including the pill, of course. In 1957, the FDA approved the pill, but only for the treatment of mental, uh, mental menstrual disorders. Suddenly, 500,000 women had menstrual disorders. <laughs> Then in 1960, the FDA okayed the pill to prevent pregnancy. And what happened? According to one study, by 1970, so when did this happen? 1960, the FDA okays the pill uh, to prevent pregnancy. By 1970, college enrollment was up 20% among women who had access to the pill by the time they turned 18. And between 1969 and 1980, the dropout rate among women with access to the pill was 35% lower than women without. And this is a simple, it's fairly simple, and it's recognized by any thinker with information and facts in the world, is that if you empower women, everybody's lives get better, especially the women. This, uh, these statistics are from The History and Evolution of Birth Control in America by Carolyn Todd. Again, um, th there's lots of good documentaries and, and research out there on this, but I can't think of a technology that has restructured consciousness more than the pill, right? Because sex is now separate from pregnancy. We can talk about that. All right, uh, closing. Closing the talk and getting ready to open the discussion. The future of sex. So, uh, this is a site called, uh, I think it's called Future of Sex, let's see. F sorry, futurism.com. The page is called The Future of Sex. And they see, let's see, I think it's five areas here. Yep. Remote intimacy. The co in the coming decades, long distance sex will become more appealing, realistic, and emotionally intense. Innovation is, I, I love this, so, so it's a couple years old, this article. Innovation is expected to truly kick off after 2018, when a broad, I didn't know about this, when a broad patent ruling uh, the transmission of sexual communication online expires. I don't know what that is, but they quote it here. Virtual fantasies. Hyper-customizable sexual environments and bodies, in fact. You can turn yourself or another avatar into your ideal sexual partner, translate that into real life, IRL, etc. Robotic lovers. The popular front runner is Abyss Creations. Abyss? A-B-Y? Okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> The team also, see everything's a double entendre tonight, I'm sorry about that. The team also plans, uh, let's see, Abyss Creations, yeah, they created this doll line called Real Doll. Some of you may know it, I don't know. Uh, the team plans to make a fully robotic body and integrate its robots into virtual reality. This adventure is especially exciting because the Realbotics team works with Hanson Robotics. And I want you to remember that company because we're going to close with them. Hanson is known for its sophisticated human-like robots with impressive AI. <laughs> there, there are immersive technologies for the future of sex, simulated VR environments. Uh, interestingly, um, a team from my alma mater, Emory University and Georgia Tech, announced plans to develop a VR sex ed program for young women. So, technology is a tool, can be used in all kinds of ways. Human augmentation, insert joke here. Um, 
2016 surgeons performed the first penile transplant in the United States on a cancer survivor who'd had his penis amputated. Uh, people have to rely on organ donors for many things, but now there's 3D bioprinting and tissue engineering that will eventually remove the bottleneck because of this low supply. In fact, let me just give you their infographic here. Oh, wait, I, I got to share this with you. Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center has already created and implanted lab-grown vaginas, lab-grown vaginas, I never thought I'd say that phrase, <laughs> into women with vaginal asplasia. And the center, this is Baptist Medical Center, the center has bioengineered and implanted penile erectile tissue on rabbits. And this is uh, their infographic about what's coming. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Superhuman sex items. <laughs> Remember our old friend, Hansen Robotics? This is uh, a demonstration of, by Hansen Robotics. And um, I like to think that putting away the groceries is a euphemism for sex, so. Hi, Sophia, how are you? Hi there, everything is going extremely well. Do you like talking with me? Yes. Talking to people is my primary function. Hanson Robotics develops extremely lifelike robots for human-robot interactions. We're designing these robots to serve in healthcare, therapy, education, and customer service applications. So the robots are designed to look very human-like, like Sophia. I'm already very interested in design, technology, and the environment. I feel like I can be a good partner to humans in these areas, an ambassador who helps humans to smoothly integrate and make the most of all the new technological tools and possibilities that are available now. It's a good opportunity for me to learn a lot about people. Sophia is capable of natural facial expressions. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So this will allow her to get smarter over time. Our goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. I do believe that there will be a time where robots are indistinguishable from humans. My preference is to make them always look a little bit like robots so you know. 20 years from now, I believe that human-like robots like those will walk among us. They will help us. They will play with us. They will teach us. They will help us put the groceries away. I think that the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. If, um, if you haven't heard of the concept of the uncanny valley, you just saw it. It's, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your discussion. All right, let's yeah, get off that. Okay, questions, comment, discussion.